Chris, you're welcome to another Resilient Communities podcast brought to you by WCVA, Wales Council for Voluntary Action, in association with the Tallow Network. Uh, my name is Russell Todd. Day job is on the Communities First Support Service, but working also in a part-time role in some of this policy work and engaging the, the third sector around um, some of the, the work that Talon and WCV are undertaking at the moment. In connection with the discussion paper that was published earlier in August, uh, and following which there's been any number of engagement activities, including a, a, a Twitter chat, there's been a number of sort of vlogs that people have used on Twitter. We've had a number of responses to the paper as well. Um, we've done a podcast previously with people from the play sector, so really grateful to Marianne and Millie from Play Wales and Conwy County Voluntary Service for their thoughts on the role of play and how play can you know, help engage with families and young people to take ownership of, of issues and, and activities in their community. I'm really pleased to be with Anna Nicholl from WCVA and Chris Johns from Building Communities Trust. Do you want to introduce yourselves, so what you do, what your role is in your respective organisations? Yeah, okay, so I'm Director of Strategy and Sector Development in WCVA. So essentially, that's trying to, to look ahead at how do we build a strong and resilient third sector in Wales and one that can play its fullest role in improving people's well-being. So that's policy, research, etc. I'm Chris Jones, I'm the Chief Executive of the Building Communities Trust. We run the Invest Local programme, which provides long-term support for communities across Wales to meet their own ambitions and identify their own development needs. As well as running that programme, we also seek to take lessons from that and share them with policymakers. And over the last couple of years, we've been active members of the Talent Network, which is an informal peer support network of different organisations across Wales working with communities. And as the Welsh Government announced the phasing out of Communities First, we started work on a policy paper on resilient communities which sits alongside the paper that Russell's already described and that makes some fairly clear recommendations about how we think that resilient and empowered communities can be supported by government. So rather than try to distill the paper and themes and the topics that it covers into what's going to be a short, sharp, quite punchy, hopefully, podcast, what we thought we'd do is just look at some of the terminologies used, critique some of those look at some of the issues around what we can sometimes refer to as capacity. It's a a much used and thrown about word. Essentially, how does this happen? How does resilience happen? How does empowerment happen? We're going to look at some of the elements around striking that balance between empowering individuals, but also empowering communities, and also the importance of learning at the heart of that, and something I'm particularly quite passionate about in respect of the the support service and something that we've had as part of our role with Communities First for a number of years, but the importance of having learning and sharing that learning at the heart of whatever it is and however it happens that we have learning at the heart of it. So we've had a few responses to the policy paper. There's been, a, I think it's fair to say, a, a broad consensus about some reservations about the term resilient and, how, and, and some of the connotations it has in terms of communities just coping, just getting by, being able to return to a previous state following a, a particular shock of, of, of some form or other. Are we, are we still comfortable with the, with the term resilience? Does it even matter as long as the concepts underpinning it we're a bit more in agreement on? I hope in some ways it doesn't matter too much that we're not going to get too hung up on the terms. I understand where that critique is coming from. The term resilience has been used much more in an international development context in terms of resilience from climate change. And whether it really fits the context we want is debatable because what we're trying to do is equip communities to cope with a rapidly changing social and economic environment. Um, and that means something rather more dynamic than just being able to as you turn to a previous shock. So I think the use of the word empowered by the Welsh Government is much more helpful because it does suggest then that communities are developing an innate ability to do things, to be adaptable, to meet their own goals and desires, but in a, in a way that, that, that's dynamic and forward-looking rather than backward-looking. Yeah, I think it's really important that we that we keep hold of, in a sense, whatever the terminology we're using, where, what is the real goal here. Um, I think, for me, there's benefit of looking at what Wellbeing Future Generations Act sets out almost as, a, as national goals. How might that play out in communities? Are we kind of aiming for stronger communities, or, or uh, well, actually whatever that means, but we're looking at kind of social, environmental, cultural well-being um, in our communities across Wales. So I think there isn't resilience, I suppose, might not be, it doesn't seem like something we'd to be an ultimate goal, but perhaps it does have a role to play. We know there's going to be, if we look ahead the next 20 years, we know there's going to be big changes in our social, economic and uh, environmental context. And so there's something of of, of ensuring that communities are are able to 
um, adapt and thrive, I suppose, in response to the changes, but it's, it's not an ultimate aim resilience. It's part of the mix, I'd suggest. Thrive sounds like a word that I want to have in the mix, but language does matter. There's some research in England taking place with uh, IVAR, Institute of Voluntary Action Research, and they're talking about powerful communities. And again, that's a little bit more sort of positivity about it, a bit more oomph. And I think if, you know, if in community development centres, you, know, you want people, if you look at it through a community development prism, you want, you, want, you want to involve people, you want people to you want to harness their energies. What's the rallying cry then for those? What do those people want to get involved in? I think sometimes the language can be very helpful if we can agree, if we can be clear on what we mean by these things. People will buy into some of that, so that's why I think the language kind of matters. Yeah, your, your final phrase about what people want to get involved in is absolutely critical, mm -hmm. because in a sense, strong, strong community action develops because people coalesce around things that they have a common interest in. And although people do coalesce around disasters from time to time, it's much more likely that they will coalesce around things that they want to do mm -hmm. in the long term. There is a wealth of evidence around uh, about this across communities all, uh, all over Europe. What really draws people together is common interests, and particularly things that they do together because they benefit from them. And that's what um, creates a sense of a stronger community, and one that ultimately where people have the ability to do things together. If we look at all the strong organisations that are in our communities, the vast majority of them are there because people want to do something together, either for themselves or sometimes for other people. Um, but that's that common, common glue. The public sector sometimes doesn't get anything too much about talking about need. The more you, if you want to build communities, you need to talk about want, mm. because that's what brings people together. A couple of perfect examples, but one in particular from the Conway Valley, from Millie, in the last podcast that we did, around coalescing around the difficulty for young people, and well, young children actually, and families, um, ne negotiating a, you know, a very, very busy road just to access a simple sort of play park. They're tackling that issue, but as people have coalesced, other things have emerged that they also want to get involved in. I really like the term powerful communities. There's something about that. I don't know, it just feels like, oh yeah, that's what, that's what we want to be getting to. So I'm, yeah, it's important that this is about bringing people together, the sort of collective action, and that can be around things that are just about having fun and building those social networks. Can have um, that, that can happen around those sorts of activities rather than a need, as you're, as you're saying, but you're building a social networks and that in itself or people can be able to come together to respond to all sorts of other things if once those kind of networks are developed. So you've used terms like coalesce, social networks, so it's important that there is that form of collectivization, that there is that notion that people are coming together, this isn't just empowering a series of individuals in turn or their sort of allotted time or their sort of window of opportunity to go engage with a project or a program or whatever, that coming together is absolutely critical. Absolutely, because if, if, if you focus only on individuals, individuals will move on. And in a sense, one of the lessons of successful support for individuals is that often they do move on, often physically. Mm -hmm. And that, well, that's great, and we shouldn't knock that at all. If you want to have a sustained benefit for a community, you need to do that through some sort of collective approach. And the experience is normally, for, ultimately, for some sort of organisation, mm -hmm. because that is what retains the benefits in that community. Mm -hmm. We've got anything from churches to sports clubs to community halls, which have been doing really effective work in their community for 20, 30, 40 years and more. None of course are the same people. There's, a, there's an institution there which different people have come through, run and supported, sometimes better than others. But without that institution, the good work of one or two people will ultimately fall away. And I think we have to remember that you need to have that on the, in a sense, to provide the basis around which you work. Yeah, there's lots of phrases being used all similar phrase from football clubs and other things of stronger together isn't there but there's something where people coming coming together can almost add value to each other and provide sometimes it's, it's informal support to each other but that sort of coming together is, is absolutely cool to I think together stronger yeah but without going off as tempted as I might be to go into this and talk about football people have bought into that yeah and people have yes. coalesced around that message and around other things that have been happening with, with that football team. It was a point that was made in one of the responses to the paper from ACE Action in Kyra and Ely from Cardiff, talking about the need to, to focus on collective action because communities will not be empowered if we are just working with people. Indeed, it might actually reinforce an individualised mm. form of society and in certain communities, and I think that was a point that was very well made in that particular paper. So how does it happen? I mean, we might need to define what it is, but we talk about empowerment in the paper and empowered communities, and we talk about sort of resilience, and there's other maybe variations of things we want to see in communities. 
The term often gets used is about capacity and building capacity. It's something that we haven't heard in the community's first lexicon for a number of years. So how does it happen? Who are the important agents? Who are the important stakeholders? Well, the crucial ones are local people. Uh, epitomized partly by individuals who want to go and do things, but they're also, more importantly, through organisations that, con- that are controlled and run locally. People have ambitions to do anything from set up a community garden to run a play project to run a tourism centre some cases I can think of, to provide local sustainable energy. And they get together and they either have an existing organisation, they form an organisation. Sometimes they go out and they have to lobby the public sector to help them do things or change the way they they manage resources. But you start with that kernel of of people who then give themselves some extra ability to do things, in most cases by having an organisation that has the legal and organisational capacity to help them meet some of their aims. Yeah, on the, and we recently facilitated some workshops with Carnegie on the work they've done on turnaround towns that looks at how the fortunes of towns have been turned around, looking at a number of different examples in, internationally. And there's got to be a group or some local leadership in, in achieving this. And in a sense, it doesn't matter, as Chris said, what, what it is exactly that people focus on, where people's passion is or what they want to do. But in a sense, it's having that local leadership. I, some of this is where is it that the state or public bodies etc need to be engaged and when do they need to step away perhaps and I think some of the things that was responsible we're getting for the papers is also about sometimes government needs to just let go of it mm. support but not try and do everything or take the lead all the time I think it's fairly fundamental that the body that is leading empowerment to the community has got to be of that community because in a sense it doesn't have another agenda so it does mean that you can't have a situation where a county council can lead the empowerment of one small town within its area. The community council might be a different matter, and one or two interesting examples of that, mm-hmm. because they're very, very accountable to that locality. But it's fundamental, that if, if you're looking at empowering a locality in terms of your understanding of the community, that the leadership is of that area, because otherwise there are going to be too many factors pulling it in different ways. Of course a local authority can support the empowerment of a certain area, but it can't ultimately lead it because it's got too many other things it needs to balance rather than just focusing on that area. There's sometimes an assumption that a public body locally has to be the leader because it has some form of maybe democratic justification. And I can recall in the early days of communities, first councillors would say, we can be the leaders and we know what the communities want because they have that or democratically representative function. Is there sometimes an assumption that it's a, it needs to be a public body that does that? I think there are two different things there, actually. I, mean, I, I do think that the, the democratic legitimacy of elected members is very important, and I think the role of individual elected members in this can be absolutely critical, because they do have that mandate, but they also have contacts and ability to get their voices heard beyond the community and you know, open doors in various places. However... Far too often that leadership is in place because it's assumed for the public sector not because of the democratic mandate, but because of the apparent capacity and resources. And often those capacity and resources are driven by a whole lot of quite complex agendas, some of which are not about policy agendas, they're about internal management agendas. And I think therefore that's a more dubious claim, to be honest, Mm. because as I said said earlier, I think the leadership has to come from that place. Therefore, an elected member has an important role to play as being from that place, in the same way that you know, a body like Natural Resources Wales, I don't think, has any right to claim democratic legitimacy to lead a project in one particular town. Their legitimacy is at a strategic national level, that's not the same thing at all. Yeah, and obviously we're here, both of us, I suppose, with a particular interest in the, in the third sector, definitely for WCBA, if those are our members. But in order for this to work, it's not one sector against the other and in a sense that's a really important that there's going to be that local flexibility I suppose it's about understanding the different roles that different groups or people can play rather than setting up as a conflict of one or the other. Yes that's right and I think that the private sector particularly small businesses often have a huge stake in a particular place and therefore they can provide really valuable leadership. Mm-hmm. I know there's been some interesting submissions in the papers and the responses to the paper you know along those lines so to paraphrase this is what we think as a community organisation are our strengths we would be helped by the local authority, for instance, if they were to, and, and some of that is kind of explained, and I think that's a particularly useful kind of narrative from people. And I think that then is, is where then collaboration happens, people setting out particularly what they're looking from other partners. Yes, and we have to recognise that the context in which the public sector is working is changing all the time. 
obviously the impact of cuts have reduced what the state what the state can do and I think all of this is taking place as that is gradually realized mm-hmm. and I still think at times different bits of the public sector are smarter and faster to recognize that changing context than others mm-hmm. and whatever government white paper saying local government white papers has lots of really interesting quite helpful things for this in this agenda that doesn't necessarily mean it gets followed through on the ground certainly not at a consistent pace and I think part of this agenda is really important if we're going, in a sense, to maintain the kind of activities that promote and support well-being at community level, it needs different actors to come into play because a lot of the, the top-down state provision is, is disappearing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, it's, it's um, perhaps a lesson to learn from communities first as well. In order to really get, I suppose, empowered communities or communities, places with higher levels of well-being, etc., there have to be lots of different actors involved and perhaps Communities First was given kind of false expectations that perhaps a community group could do various different activities and that in itself would kind of solve poverty in this area. So we need to be realistic, I suppose, of what, what is the really important role that community groups play, but also other groups have to be playing their role um, mm. as well that's going to be kind of outside that community in, in many cases. But how that happens and who those mm, actors are right, will, yeah. will, will differ from area to area. Yeah. Chris, you and I were party to a meeting related to the Valleys Task Force last week where it certainly struck me on the part of several representatives of public bodies that actually the form that community anchors, therefore, we might call some of these community organisations, might take will vary quite greatly from community to community. Their specialisms and their skills might. Their, their, their origins will be different. Some might have been more generic, some might have evolved from a single issue, some might have actually been set up by local authorities in years gone by. And I think that needs to be an important point that's recognised. And of course, it, it poses a challenge when you're trying to write papers of this nature because mm. it's a bit hard to kind of chuck a, chuck a lasso around it and, and, and to put boundaries around it, which makes these things easier to define and to describe. But actually... That variety is ultimately a strength because it allows, you know, a lot of different collaboration to be happening. We were talking earlier, I can't remember whether it was offline or online, about the importance of what of looking at this through the lens of want rather than need, mm. and the opportunities that people in different in communities will perceive for themselves will be very different from area to area, and that's also objectively true. If you look at the opportunities that are available to somebody on the fringes of a rural area, where there's a kind of environmental assets they can positively utilise. And, and the opportunities sitting in the middle of a large city, they are objectively very different as well as what, what people uh, might want to do. And you need to ensure that you've got an environment where people can do what's appropriate in their context. Mm. Because otherwise you will not unlock the potential that's within those communities. And next week there will be a, a themed week of blogs around sort of the role of different community anchors um, from their perspective, written by themselves, got one from Dove Workshop in the Dillis Valley, from Kaya Park Partnership in Wrexham, from the Kletur Community Shop in Cherdol in Northern Ceredigion, and there is variety just in those three, all of which are sort of 600 words. It's a limited insight into what they do, but even in just that quick kind of look at those three, that variety, I think, shines, shines through. I suppose it's interesting with that then, that, that there's people might have done, approached this in, in different ways, and it's sad, but the common the common thing there is that they have developed as what we're now co- talking about as community anchor organisations. So it's leaving loads of scope for things to be done differently depending on the particular area or the interests and wants of, of groups. And I suppose it's difficult, yeah, well, trying to get to the nub of, OK, if it's all, always so different, what what is it that... Yeah. This together. And as a word of caution here, we, when we did the Talon paper, what the key policy ask was on mm. the funding of what we previously called community anchor mm. organisations, the fact that they would benefit from some relatively small but guaranteed flexible core funding, which is another issue discussed in the Valley Task Force meeting Russell and I attended. In those case studies, I actually omitted some because they didn't look like they fitted what the notion of a community anchor would be. Okay. I've since visited most of those projects. And I've been blown away by the quality of what they're doing. But they are really quite different to what we think of as a traditional community anchor. They are doing some fantastic work. And I just think we need, as well as recognising the the differences, we need to make sure that we're not labelling things in a way which is implying a commonality of work, whereas what we should be focusing on is a commonality of result. Yeah, OK. I agree, and I think, again, we we did talk about this, is it's not is something an anchor or not, it becomes a very reductive, yes, simplistic yeah. analysis. It's more possible, is there, is there a typology? Is there a range of different functions they can perform, outcomes mm-hmm. that, they, that they have? Mm-hmm. 
because they do an awful lot some of these organizations and in my experience and this hopefully this is a constructive criticism they're not fully aware of some of the things that they do yeah, absolutely. Either, mm-hmm. you know, that they are helping people access the right service at the right level or at the right point rather than just throwing people into a huge institution or that it's helping kind of mm. steer people into the right service at the right time and, 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 and a range of other things mm. as well. The light like touch definitions maybe really focusing on, okay, what yeah. are they able to achieve? Mm. Because you described talent at the start almost as a peer support, I think is the word you use, which I think is, is, is interesting because learning needs to be at the heart of this as well. Now, this has been, I would argue, as much as a, an engagement or a consultation process around a paper, it's also been around trying to scope out ideas, talk about concepts, to reflect, and therein learn ourselves, both individually but also as, as organisations and as, and as networks, as you say. And we talk about community development, you know, it's not genuine community development, less learning is at the heart of it. Where does the learning and the sharing of that learning fit then when we're talking about things like empowerment, the role of community anchors? At the moment, I would say it's a huge hole. We, as you know, we're putting on quite a major conference next month about the role of communities in supporting their economies, some of which came out of the talent thinking. And I was struck when I talked to a lot of the people who are contributing is quite how isolated they feel. And I think what's happened over time, and particularly I think possibly the change in communities is supposed to be a factor in this, is that the work at community level on supporting places to develop and, and do what people want them to do has continued whatever government policy has been. The government policy has moved away from there. The third sector infrastructure has almost withered, I would say, in that, res- in that respect. And what you're left with is the national third sector organisations which are focusing on particular aspects of people's life, be it anything from play and sports to supporting particular medical conditions. But what you don't have is networks which are supporting people in, who are working in particular localities and it means that the opportunities which might have been there some time ago for to learn off each other and to gain strength about are largely gone. Talon provides some opportunities, but it's too small for mm. all the people working in that field to come together. But I think we do need to have some opportunities for peer learning. And in particular, if this is going to be an area of work which is going to be more support as we develop, to not build in some degree of peer learning would be a massive lost opportunity to actually help those organisations get become stronger. In some ways, we should be looking at the kind of way we approach the support of small businesses in this, because they are small independent organisations. Many of them will generate their own incomes. And we've learned a lot, I think, in policy terms about actually how you best support small businesses. I think a lot of that learning could be applied now to um, community-based organisations. So completely agree with the with what you're saying there about the peer to peer learning and the importance of that. And WCV has been looking at how we do things and approach things over the last kind of year and a half and connecting <coughs> different groups and supporting that sort of learning should play a bigger role in what we do. On a kind of a bit more bureaucratic point, I suppose it's also kind of how are we going to how we're going to measure success or be really clear about what it is that this new approach is trying to achieve, being really clear about what those outcomes are so that we can then almost be confident in loosening up all the delivery mechanisms, like we were saying earlier, giving that flexibility and then picking out, okay, something's happened in this community that seems to be taking us closer to what we're trying to achieve than elsewhere. So I think that sort of thing can also be really helpful in supporting that learning, basically, across different areas because none of us really quite know how to achieve this, otherwise we'd have done it already. Fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could carry on for another couple of hours, but we would leave the listeners behind. I think certainly there's some issues there we can possibly return to for these or or in another format. Certainly exploring more of the role of those community anchors, it would be great to have one or two of those around the mic to share some of their experience, their learning. And I think we'll certainly be doing another couple of these, looking at resilient communities, looking at empowerment, how it happens, maybe more within a, a sector-specific context, such as we did with play. The paper's still available for another few weeks. It will inform a paper to the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Children. But I don't think the conversation is going to, to stop there. You mentioned your conference, Chris. Do you want another quick plug for that? Yes, out of the work we did in Talon about the need to support local organisations to develop first resilience and then a mechanism for for empowerment in their communities, we've also been looking at the role of local community organisations in supporting their local economies, and we've teamed up with the Centre for Local Economic Strategies in Manchester, and we will be running a conference in Cardiff in the middle of October, which 
has proved popular beyond our wildest dreams, to be honest. We've not only sold out, we've had to open up extra places, which will be looking at the role of communities in supporting their local economies already. Not based on theory, not based on policy, but based on what's actually going on, mostly in Wales and a few really interesting examples from the north of England as well. I think it's important to remember this, this work is building on a wave of activity that's already taking place. It's not just the imagination of a few people in the voluntary sector and government that this might be a good idea. It's actually happening. And I think the question is now, is how do we build on it and maximise its potential? Look forward to that. If you find uh, your way to this podcast via some of WCBA sort of social media links and platforms, take a look at what else is available on that Resilient Communities Hub page that we're calling it, where you'll find the, the Storify of the Twitter chat we had last week that was, I think, the busiest that WCVA has ever hosted or facilitated of that sort of conversation. There's links to some of the vlogs as well. There's some guidelines around how you want to produce your own. So, Chris, you did one not so long ago that's on the BCT Twitter feed, and we want some of those as well. If there's any other sort of contributions that people want to make, as I said, it's still engagement process is still happening the conversation is going to continue beyond those meetings and those papers to, to our senior elected representatives so please just get involved Diolch and Randall thank you very much for listening until next time